How you doing, folks? Hi, Fred. Everyone good? Excited? You made it in? The rain, the parking, the, the exodus of students. But anyways, we're going to get started. Um, you know, some of you know me. I'm Chris Laverme. I'm the transition coordinator here at Greenwich High School. Um, and I really appreciate everyone, uh, parents, uh, staff, uh, you know, attending, registering for today. Uh, a couple of notes. First, I want to introduce uh, Carlene Wood. Hi. So our representative, uh, you know, is actually kind of supervises the high school uh, special ed PPS from downtown Havemeyer. So, Carly, I don't know if you want to say hello. And Hi, everyone, and I'm so glad to see so many parents here, especially some of our parents with students out of district. So it's nice that you all were here. Thank you for coming. Great, thank you. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things before we move on. First off, as you can see, we're going to be video recording our presentation today. Uh, now, Jason's going to focus on video recording the speakers, um, but what we ask is when we get to the question and answer time, please try to keep, um, you know, uh, specific names, names, names of your, your, your children out of the discussion um, in terms of confidentiality and confidentiality purposes. We really would prefer that. Uh, I would really appreciate that. Um, and we really appreciate Jason for coming and, and taking time to, to record today. And we're going to, what that means is this will hopefully be posted on a high school website. So those of you that want to go back and take a look, or if you know someone that could not make it today, uh, they will be able to access this information by watching the video online. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, staff members that are here so far, please make sure that you sign in. Whether your name is on the list or not, please make sure you sign in so that you get credit for attendance. Um, and just curious, I know at this point, how many parents do we have? Just a quick raise of hands. Okay, excellent, it's a great showing, super, super. And as I said, some of our staff is gonna be uh, coming in in the next 10, 15 minutes. So we're just gonna get started now and we're gonna move on. We really have a great panel. How's that set up? Great. Yeah. <laughs> we have, really, this is wonderful. It's a little bit of a coup to kind of have um, the five agencies and speakers from the five agencies come down to Greenwich um, all at the same time. So I'm really happy that you're here to take advantage of it. Um, we're gonna go through each agency. The, each agency representative is gonna have about 10 to 15 minutes to briefly explain who they are, the agency, eligibility, services, so on and so forth. We're gonna hold questions until the last hour. The last hour, we'll open it up to questions. So please feel free just to write your questions down and then we'll ask the questions when we get through each and every speaker. I know we have five. I, 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 there's gonna be a ton of information. You know, uh, some of it may be really exciting. Some of it, you know, it's your typical, you know, we're dealing with state agencies. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're gonna do the best we can. Right, Sean, Brian, uh, Kathleen. We have four state agencies, right? And Thalia, you're not. So you have all the exciting things. You're state, okay. So, so I'm gonna briefly, I'm gonna say who's here, and then we're gonna start. Um, so first, I just want to introduce Mr. Sean Kennedy. He's a counselor with the Level Up program with the Department of Rehabilitation Services. Sean, we have Mr. Brian Smith, Assistant Manager of the West Region of the Department of Developmental Services. Brian, uh, we have Mr. Luis Velasquez from Abelis Incorporated. He is the Senior Director of Day Services. Um, and we have Ms. Uh, Dr. Thalia uh, Caminos. Good? Perfect. Okay. Um, and she is the intake supervisor at the uh, Southwest Connecticut Mental Health Services, Young Adult Services, also out of what is the FS Du Bois Center in Stanford. Uh, and then last, but certainly not least, we have Miss uh, Kathleen Calway, Autism Support and Resource Specialist from the State Department of Social Services, Autism Spectrum Disorder Services. So we have really a fine panel here today. So we welcome them to Greenwich. You know, it's kind of a little joke, but I'll try it anyways, you know. I tried it on Carlene yesterday, it didn't work. Um, you know, it, 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 for those of you that follow, you know, the movies, The Godfather Saga, you know, it's kind of like the five families, getting the five families together. So we got the five agencies together, um, and, and, and I'm looking forward to it. So without further, further hesitation, I'm gonna invite Mr. Sean Kennedy to come up and speak on the Department of Rehab Services, the Level Up program. Sean, it's all yours. Um, so as 
Chris, that's it. Um, my name is Sean, um, and I work for the Department of Rehabilitation Services. Um, for some of you guys, you may have um, seen me. Some parents in here may have been working with me as well. Um, to kind of start off, I like to kind of do the umbrella because there have been some changes in our agency in the past. Um, so back um, a couple years ago, um, the Department of Rehabilitation Services was established. Um, and so it's a state agency that provides services to individuals with disabilities. Um, prior to that, um, the agency that I work for, the uh, program that I work for, co program is the Bureau of Rehab Services. We were always under DSS um, in the Department of Ed a while ago. Um, but back when we started our um, new agency, we fell under the Department of Rehabilitation Services. Um, so what the Bureau of Rehab Services is, it's a um, vocational rehabilitation service program um, for the state of Connecticut. There is 79 folk rehab programs in the United States. Um, and the purpose of the both rehab programs are to provide services to individuals with disabilities to help them prepare, obtain, and maintain employment. Back in 2014, 2015, um, because of new federal legislation under the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act, or otherwise known as uh, WIOA, uh, we had to spend a certain amount of our budget on something called pre-employment transition services. So every single vocational rehab service program in the United States has to spend a certain amount of their budget on transition services. So in the state of Connecticut, we created a program called the Level Up Program. Um, so the umbrella really is Department of Rehabilitation Services, under the Department of Rehab Services, there are a variety of different bureaus, one being the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services, the Bureau of Education Services for the Blind, and there's a couple others. And under the Bureau of Rehab Services is a couple different programs, one of them, the Level Up Program, and that's why I'm here today. Um, so um, what the Level Up Program is, it's really to provide services to individuals um, with disabilities, um, students who are between the ages of 16 to 21 while they're still in high school. Um, so our, the Level Up program, um, someone is eligible um, while they're in high school or under the auspices of the Board of Education. Um, and what the role of the Level Up counselor is in the Level Up program is to provide the pre-employment transition services. And there are four or five core categories that we are mandated to provide and only can provide under um, the legislation. And I'll go try to go through it, remember. Um, the first one is job exploration, guidance and counseling around post-secondary education, work-based experiences such as job shadowing, informational interviewing, and depending on our budget every year, we do sometimes have a work program in the summer. Um, then we have introduction to self-advocacy and independent li um, living, and then career readiness skills. So, the program that we designed is that we have to provide all those five core services. And what our agency did is we came up with different programs um, to provide those services. One of the services that we have provided is something called the Career Assessment Services. And under the Career Assessment Services, it's working with them to find their career interests, their, um, and what falls under that is job shadowing, informational interviewing, um, getting the student out there in the community to really get a sense of what they're interested in. Other programs that we have designed within Level Up have been geared towards self-advocacy, um, workplace readiness, and so it's an opportunity for them, you know, I like to say start early, talk often. 
um, about transition services um, because that's very important. The conversation really should be starting early, um, both in the school and with our agency. And my role as the counselor is I work hand in hand with Chris, um, and Chris refers different students to me. And from that opportunity, I do an intake, get a sense if they should be with our services and you know is it a good time to refer sometimes we say that we may want them closer to graduation because if we get some our program 16 to 21 but if we know someone is going to the age of 21 um, in the transition program we say let's may hold off until the beginning of their transition program because the services that I kind of talked about the career assessment services we can really only provide once so it's not a um, yearly thing. It's really only being able to ride once. Um, now I'm going to go into kind of the eligibility process for um, our services. To be eligible, um, someone just has to be on an IEP, a 504 plan, or have a significant barrier to it. Um, so that's the criteria. Um, so when Chris contacts me, he lets me know there's a student, I come and meet with him, do the referral, get all the information <coughs> possible. Um, and then my role is I really come once a month to meet with the students individually or in groups um, to talk about you know, career interests. Um, learning about disability and that's a that's a big key thing for us it's because our services are geared to individuals with disabilities my main role is talking about disability and really what that means for the individual and for the student um, and how that may affect them on a job and really working with them to become as independent as possible because we want to help them become independent because the school isn't always going to be there. Um, we want to help them, you know, make those measurable skill gains, those milestones in their life. Because, again, the school, as I said, isn't going to always be there, um, the support from the school. Um, so it's our role, really, to help them become as independent as possible. Um, so that's kind of my role monthly. Um, as I talked a little bit about um, ago, we provide those other programs. We contract out for those programs, um, such as the career assessment. We contract out um, the uh, vendor that I have working here is um, Goodwill. Um, and Goodwill's responsibility is I refer the student to Goodwill, and they would go out and find the job shadowing experience for the individual uh, or the career uh, interest inventories. And um, in the summer, we have our work experience. They develop the job um, sites for the individuals. And then they provide some support on the job. Because um, our, our services are really to help prepare someone for competitive, integrated employment. So when they do graduate, they can move on to get a job and be as independent as possible on a job. Because our services will never be one-to-one -one job coaching 24-7 on a job. We really are here to help get them as independent on the job as possible with some support or minimal minimal support on the job. We like to have them lean off support. And um, unlike kind of other agencies, our agency is a short-term agency. So when someone is competitively employable after high school, after college, um, and they're satisfied with their job, they're happy, our services would start to wean off and we would close out a case. That being said, we can always reopen a case. You know, say a job changes or they need more training for a job, they can always come back and reapply. Say they may need more job coaching hours or um, an on-the-job training um, because maybe um, the employer is asking them to do more which is great, that's what we want to see. Um, so kind of overall, that is in a nutshell of um, the services that we provide. Um, 
again, um, we use, utilize the term for level up any potentially eligible student for vocational rehabilitation services. And I don't want to go too much into adult services because it will start to confuse anyone, everyone. Uh, but once they do graduate, they are transitioned into our adult service program. And you have to apply for adult services. Having me as the counselor hopefully makes it more of an easier transition. Um, and applying for adult services, what we look at for adult services, first we look at the disability. Secondly, then we look, can they benefit from the services? And thirdly, the functional limitations. How is the disability going to be a barrier to employment? Um, so those are the three things that we look at to um, for eligibility purposes for adults and the adult um, services. Again, I don't want to go too much into depth with it because we're here with the Level Up program, but um, for Level Up it's all an IEP, 504 plan, or some type of significant barrier. Um, I think we'll, we're feeding questions at the end. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. good. All right. Thanks, Sean. Okay. You know, just a couple of things before we move on. Uh, and, and Mr. Uh, Brian Smith is our next speaker. But a couple of things just to, to kind of piggyback on what Sean said. Uh, just, just some things, some terms, terminology. Integrated competitive employment. And we maybe maybe you'll have a question about that when we get to the question and answer time. Integrated competitive employment. Time limited services and independence. Super, super important terms and philosophies of the Department of Rehab Services. So when we get to the question and answer, you may have a question or two about those terms relating to uh, doors. So next up, without further hesitation, uh, Mr. Brian Smith, Assistant Manager, West Region, DDS. Come on up there. A little intro there. Oh. I apologize for the kids on the camera. I'm gonna move around. I can't stand the on the I can't do that. So try to, I'm gonna go slow so you can follow me around. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Brian Smith. I'm actually an assistant regional director, but that's okay. It's all good. <laughs> Some, somebody promoted me last week. You can call me okay. regional director. I still haven't seen that in my pay, but that's all right. Um, I'm based here in the West region. Um, DDS is three regions statewide, West, North, and South. Um, divides the state equally into thirds. Uh, my office is currently based in Waterbury, but obviously I get around a lot, and I'm in Cheshire. Danbury, Norwalk, um, Stratford, Torrington, wherever the needs are, that's where I end up. Um, email is there. Feel free to email me any questions that you come up with after you're on your way home tonight or tomorrow. Um, I will get back to you by email faster than phone, I will be honest with you, because um, I have the phones there. I can do that from the road. Um, what I'm going to do today is just quickly talk about, we're gonna, there we go, perfect. Um, how to apply for DDS services, what does eligibility look like if I'm made eligible, what types of services can I expect. Um, briefly touch base real quick on how we collaborate with um, other state agencies as well. So here we go. So this is what our website currently looks like. As we speak today, the revolving pictures may change, but overall this is the format. You will see on this button right here on our website, nice little orange yellow button that says eligibility. If you click on that, it will bring you to another screen to which you can choose to apply for somebody. There we go. You have an option to apply for somebody under the age of three, birth to three services. We have a lot of youth who come out of birth to three programs, and they, as part of their discharge plan from those services, they go and apply for DDS services. Number two is applying for somebody with intellectual disability. Number three is applying for somebody with autism or no intellectual disability. And four is applying for somebody who used to be with us, disengaged services, and wants to reopen. Um, when I started about 16 and a half years ago working for DDS, um, you couldn't do this. You had to make a phone call, give your name, your phone number, your address, and they mailed you the application. The legislature insisted we keep track of how many applications went out the door, how many came back. 
those days are over, you can go online, click on that, and it produces the application options for you. Um, if you want to click on the book, second button, the second bullet down for me, that would be great, thank you. Yep, perfect. This screen will tell you uh, eligibility fact sheet. The application is in English and in Spanish, okay? Um, there is <clears throat> um, information you can ask by doing an email. Every single application for DDS goes to Hartford. That's where our eligibility unit is housed. I believe currently there's three to four staff who are in that um, unit. So the more complete the application is, the faster it gets through the pipeline, because uh, there's not a lot of eyes and hands processing those applications. The application itself is about three pages long, though when you print it out, it's more. There's some releases of information, instructions, and things like that that go into it, but all in all, it's only about two and a half, three pages in length. The bulk of the material is you're gonna be submitting is gonna be records that you have of your family member. I did provide one of these eligibility requirements, check sheets. When you open up the application, there's gonna be a checklist. That's the first page on the application. This gives you a little more detail as a type of tests that we're looking for. Um, you, please don't panic. It does have a massive list of cognitive tests. We don't want one of everything. These are the types that our psychologists were looking for when they, people are applying for services to give you an idea that if you don't have one, this would be an appropriate cognitive test that would be accepted by our eligibility unit. So you don't have to have one of all of them, and the same, the same rules apply with adaptive tests as well as um, tests on autism, which I'll allow Kathy to talk about. Um, most of your records are going to come from your doctor's offices that you have for your family member and the school system. So all the school system pro professionals in the room, please, please, please help families out as much as you can. IEPs, PTOT speech, and any of the cognitive tests done at the triennials. Um, make a nice little package for the families seeking assistance, that would be most helpful. For the families in the room, please make a copy of everything you sent to us as far as your application is concerned. Two reasons. Reason number one doesn't happen a lot, but just in case it gets lost in the mail, you have a copy and can resubmit another copy. More importantly, if you are denied eligibility, you have appeal rights. So you will be able to read that letter of, of denial, identify what they had indicated as to why they denied, and look at what you gave us and see if there's things missing that you should have submitted and didn't by chance or go out and get those additional tests done. Um, so it gives you an idea so you can cross-reference of what you uh, gave us versus the denial letter. Start to finish. If you mailed it today, you're looking anywhere around two to three months on average might move a little faster depending on the flow of applications coming in for that unit. It will depend on how complete that application is that you get an answer as well. Um, core things about eligibility. For DDS services, you're looking, um, an individual must have an IQ of 69 or lower, so falling within the realm of intellectually disabled with uh, deficits and adaptive behavior as well. Okay, that's why the third option up there was somebody who has autism but does not have intellectual disability. That's where the line is. It's that IQ score is gonna be the line in the sand. So we have a lot of young men and women who have a diagnosis of autism but also intellectual disability. Their IQs fall in the 60s or the 50s or even the 40s. They would be under DDS side of supports and services. But for those young men and women who might be falling into the 80s or 90s of IQ, they would not fall under DDS, and we would be working with our colleagues at DSS under the autism program, okay? So after you're made eligible, if you're in the West region, which you are, because you're Greenwich, your file would be sent to Cheshire, okay? Um, how do I get a case manager? Your son, daughter, family member, whomever it is, would need to have um, Medicaid, Title 19. Um, but regardless, this brochure that's over there are a bunch of supports and services that you would have access to after being determined eligible for DDS services. It includes access to our respite centers, it includes access to family grants, some support staff like our transition advisors, our education advisor, our psychologist. Uh, we do have a part-time speech and an OT. We have nurses and we have some behavioral support staff as well. We also have family support workers, which are residential workers who have left our residential settings, our group homes, 
our regional centers and have chosen to work in a community, they can be assigned to do some in-home services and community access services for families and individuals. Um, those are just a few of the different types of things that are in this brochure. Be happy to answer questions during the Q&A time or via email. Um, but as you go through this process of eligibility, you are notified by letter. As your file is shipped from Hartford to Cheshire, you are then notified by letter of who the contacts are. You will get one of these handy little brochures in the mail. So we keep trying to maintain that communication along, along the way. Key things, since we're in the high school setting, is everybody here high school or we have other teachers, professionals, families that have younger kids? Do we have any, any middle school representation? Any middle school teachers? No? Okay. Most of right. So there's information about transitioning. And as I mentioned, we do transit, we have a transition advisor um, currently, and I'm hiring two additional ones as we speak, just waiting for uh, all the HR stuff. Um, so we're gonna have one housed in Danbury, one in Stratford, and one in Cheshire. Um, Grinders will be served out of the Stratford office. But we work in collaboration with Doors, um, Sean's agency, a lot. I actually meet with the district director of Doors every single month to review all the youth coming out in June and then we'll start looking at next June, and then the June after. Why is that? We are promoting employment. Whatever you can do as families, whatever you can do as school professionals to push employment, regardless of what their abilities are or needs are, everybody has an opportunity to strive for a meaningful job in their community. Um, but we look at that. We wanna make sure that that agency is doing what they should be doing. <laughs> and we're doing what we're doing, but Eventually, as Sean mentioned, they're going to fade away. And if our agency is engaged with that same youth, we're planning for them for those supports and they help them maintain that job. If they lose a job, we call up the Sean's of the world and say, hey, Brian lost his job, we need to reactivate the case. And we go back and forth depending on that, how that person's career path goes. Okay, but we are in constant communication, constant communication um, with respect to all the grads. The good news is I was in a meeting in Waterbury this morning before coming here, and I challenged my commissioner as to the status of funding for grads coming out this June. And he basically said the budget reads as though there will be funding for the grads coming out in June. That's good news. Did you say that again? Yeah. As of this morning's message I got from the commissioner, there is money in the budget for graduates who are exiting Granite High School in June for services that commence after July 1st. That's amazing. That's All amazing. right? That's huge. And I say that, I like that good news. You know, I thought good news. I got the little chills. <laughs> um, last year, the graduates who exited in June did not, we did not get alerted that there was funding in the budget, and we all know why, there was no state budget. So we were operating without a state budget. We couldn't start anything brand new because we were working on a month to month disbursement from Harvard. <clears throat> Those graduates last year did not get money, access to dollars, to start employment services or day services like with an agency that Lewis represents until November, around Thanksgiving. Okay, so they were out of school, June whatever was your last day, until we may start making phone calls right around the Thanksgiving mark that funding was released, we could start planning and getting things going. And <clears throat> the agencies like Ableist, the agencies like Goodwill that Sean mentioned, or Marrakesh, or Star, or Clasp, or whoever you're working with. <laughs> you don't call them up one day and say, hey, I got money. Let's start tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. Um, it takes two or three weeks to get things in place. So even though I can send a message that we have funding available, and that grad can start, it takes a two to three weeks, maybe even four weeks for some to get things and literally have them walk through that door. Would you agree, Louis? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to say that, I saw that now. <laughs> um, a lot of it has to do with transportation, coordinating transportation, and a lot of it also has to do with staff. Hiring staff. Hiring staff, you need extra staff in the program. Or it might mean developing a new program. A lot of our providers are starting to do that as well to, to meet the needs of the newer populations coming out of the school districts. So, um, so we constantly are working in collaboration with DOORS about the employment. We realize not everybody's gonna land a job when they're in school, but if you are gonna land a job, we are committed to maintaining that job. So we will get money out the door to help those job coaches stay in play for those youth who have employment before and upon exiting school. 
Okay, we will work with each and every one of those teams on that. For those who employment currently is not the immediate pathway, there's plenty of other service options that our case management staff will be happy to work with each of those families with. And finding providers like Ableist or whomever in your community that you want to access. So, um, on average, just so you know, we have about three to 400 graduates every single year statewide. Doesn't seem like a large number, but that is funding that we're asking for each and every year in our state budget. So we are advocating every year for new dollars for that new grad population every single June. It's an easy target when they're looking at cutting budgets. So I was very excited when I challenged my commissioner this morning to get an answer out of him when he said that. I'm like, thank you. I don't have to live last summer like I did. None of our families have to go through that. None of the other families had to go through it. So, um, but feel free, email me any specific questions that we don't get to later. Am I good on time? About three or four minutes. Oh, wow. For me? Yeah. <laughs> never happens. Um, it's kind of stuff. So um, feel free to take those materials. Um, we do have offices in Norwalk at our regional center campus. We have office in Danbury on Main Street. We have an office in Torrington at our regional center campus. We have our head office for our regions in Waterbury, which is what I'm based out of. And we do have another office in Stratford at that campus. And we also have an office in Cheshire, Cheshire. Um, so that's our regional offices. This area is served out of Stratford. So any case management services would come out of that office, and actually Norwalk, excuse me, Norwalk and Stratford, depending on our case loads. Um, so all your case management needs would be dealt out of there. We do have a respite center in Norwalk. So for families who are interested in that service, that's the closest respite center program for that. We also do have the big Southbury Training School in the region, but that is actually its own separate entity. Um, we don't get engaged with that, but we do access some of their services. We do also have two dental clinics in our camp, in our region. We have one in Stratford, and we have one in Southbury as well. So for families who have difficulty accessing dental services in your community, that's another um, option for those young men and women is to tap into those clinics. It does take a little bit of a while scheduling wise, but it is a great resource available as well. So, Brian, you just maybe you mentioned it, maybe I missed it. Talk a little bit about the helpline. Helpline. So that brochure there, as I mentioned, when you get through eligibility, file sent to Cheshire. Cheshire is where our helpline is located. If your family member does not have active Medicaid, Title 19, specifically Husky C, um, they will be serviced out of our helpline. On the back of that brochure is their email address, and on the back of that brochure is the phone number. It's toll free. Excuse me, toll free in Connecticut. That's your point of contact for our department at that time. Okay, again, you'll get a notification via, via letter um, of all that information, but you have it right there already. They will guide you. If you don't have a case manager, you don't have a Brian in Norwalk, there's a Brian in Cheshire who's answering the phone and responding to your calls, making the referrals for services, or linking you with community resources. It's more of a reactive system to you calling or emailing them in this proactive of us reaching out and saying, hey, we haven't connected in a while, how is Ryan doing? So uh, feel free to call them, inquire. We might, be not, we might not be the one providing that service to you, but we might be able to make that linkage to something in your community or another state agency or a private provider uh, or a family group, like Connecticut Family Support Network has uh, resources down in this area as well. So that would be your point of contact. They're phenomenal, we currently have two staff um, I'm waiting for my applicant pool on the third staff, which I hope will be bilingual, because we desperately need Spanish-speaking staff on our helpline. Um, so I'm hoping to hire that person. And they will also be targeting our transition age group. So working with families on the applications for guardianship, if it's appropriate, conservatorship, if it's appropriate, um, as well as your state, uh, federal and state benefits. So that way we can get you moved into a local office and have that more direct contact with our agency. So, but I rest assured, if you go through eligibility, if Brian goes through eligibility, is made eligible, regardless if you use us or not, we're planning for you. Okay, that's the key, one key piece. Whether you want to engage our agency or not, that's your choice. We're not stormtroopers, we're not gonna pound down your door and say you must work with us. No, that's not how we operate. We are planning that. So Brian's name, Brian's date of birth, Brian has a DDS number, that's all in our system. Brian shows up on the list for graduating this coming June. Whether we've had conversations or not, we're planning for Brian leaving in June. 
based on a generic value, which tends to be projected high, so that way we're safe. But um, if you choose not to apply, that's your choice. We encourage you to apply, we encourage you to engage us, but if you apply, eligible, and you don't engage us, that's okay too. Rest assured, we all are playing, and we are advocating for resources. Okay, that's super, can I help you? Good, <laughs> thanks, you're welcome. Okay, appreciate that. I'm glad that the uh, technology worked. I just want to shout out to, yes. Uh, can you turn on the lights? Turn on the lights? Yeah. Is that good? Uh, yeah. 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 It's good. It's great. It's good. A um, couple of things. First off, a big shout out in the booth. Uh, Celeste Vigilante is helping us with technology. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for helping us. Uh, just a couple of points. Again, as we kind of develop questions for the question and answer time uh, with DBS, uh, I, think, I think, Brian, I stopped counting. Um, I think you mentioned budget at least eight times. Uh, budget. Budget. I'm not sure. Are we left? Good. Um, I'm not sure how often in P, uh, PPTs that we talk about budget, which, you know, but with adult services, you're going to hear budget, budget. Also, I heard Brian talk about employment as a focus, and I heard meaningful job in the community. So again, to help think about questions for when we get to the question and answer, I think those are some areas that are, that are pretty darn important. Okay, moving on. Without further hesitation, to kind of our local agency, our local agency right down here in Greenwich, that provides a lot of the direct service, a lot of the direct service from DDS, um, and in past years actually BRS as well. I'm not sure if that's still. Um, but we're going to have uh, Mr. Luis Velasquez, and he is the senior uh, director of day services with Ableist. Luis, come on. everybody. Um, as Chris said, I'm here representing Ableist. Ableist is a, uh, an organization that provides services and supports to individuals with developmental disabilities across the lifespan. Across the lifespan meaning uh, we have early intervention services, so we're working with families at the very, very beginning of the diagnosis, and we're supporting them through their entire lives. Uh, as part of our day supports, we have senior services as well for those folks who have gone through our employment program and who choose to retire. We have more therapeutic services set up for those folks. Um, our, our programs are divided into uh, therapeutic services, uh, which constitutes um, um, early intervention, um, customized therapies uh, in the areas of speech, language, uh, behavioral supports. Um, and, their, and life services. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, I'm the senior director of uh, the day program, so I'm directly in charge of uh, our day have program, which is more therapeutic based. Those folks need a little bit more uh, supports. Um, fo the focus isn't so much on the vocational, but the, the needs in, in the areas of, of uh, therapies, different therapies. Um, I'm also responsible for uh, transitions, uh, so we're working with school systems to get those young people from the school setting into adult services. Um, employment, um, just as it the, the, um, states, we're looking to get the, the folks that are supported by us into the community, working meaningful jobs um, in the areas that they have a passion for. Um, and. Uh, Recreation um, and residential supports. Um, we also have under our day supports our life skills program, and that's you know specifically um, geared towards the, the the needs of the young people that are transitioning from school-based supports to adult services. Our life skills program is a community-based program, so it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's uh, they're community-based sites, so they're not going to one big building where you know where all the supports are in under one roof it's a community-based site so we have a site here in Greenwich at the First Presbyterian Church uh, we have a site in Stanford we have a site in Westport uh, we have a site in Wilton those sites are specifically geared to, to address the needs of individuals in their own communities um, and as part of as part of the supports we're 
helping young people uh, with, with work. Uh, we're offering volunteer opportunities. We're offering skill development. We're offering behavioral supports. We're offering all the things that will help make a full life for these individuals in the community. Um, activities, very important. Uh, we have a very rich activities program. Um, we have activities in different age groups um, that you know, just run the gambit of activity. So we're talking about art, we're talking about music, we're physical uh, activities, you know, gym, um, uh, men's groups that, you know, go to the gym and hang out. And, and so it, it helps create a full life for the individuals that we serve. So uh, we're, we're providing a day where they're engaged in meaningful work activities. We're helping them uh, make connections with other folks in the community through our recreation program and we're also supporting folks in our residential services. Um, at this point, we're, uh, I think we have about 35 <coughs> residential options. Those options include um, group homes, more traditional group homes, supported living, home shares. Home share uh, is basically uh, a setup where somebody without a disability is supporting somebody with a, di with a disability in uh, a residence. Uh, like I said, we're at about 34, 35 situations now. That continues to grow. We're gonna have two more uh, set up by the end of the year. So we, we're continually growing our program as the needs of the community increases. And we're spreading our footprint so that now we're providing support not just to the folks here in Greenwich, but we're providing folks, uh, we're providing support to folks in the new communities, Wilton and Westport. Um, and we're bringing folks in from Ridgefield, from Norwalk, from Weston, we're, we're really spreading, spreading out to, to really offer opportunities to everyone. Um, specifically for, for you folks here, for transition services, I said we're working very closely with schools to help prepare these young people to come to us and, and to be able to, to adapt to our program, because it's a very different setup. Um, we're, we're participating in PBT meetings. We're, uh, working with the schools and doing observations at work sites. We're having folks come to our program and access what we do. Uh, we set up a broad variety of models depending on the individual need. Um, it's all very individualized. Our services um, are really geared to the specific needs of the individual. We try to do that for everybody. Um, what else can I touch on? Uh, <laughs> Basically, it's, uh, we're, uh, like I said, we're continuing to grow. Um, we're very excited about our expansion into Wilton and Westport because that really expands our footprint and our ability to provide more, um, more enhanced, more comprehensive services to the individuals that we support. We work very closely with DDS. They license all of our homes. Uh, they license our day program and provide funding that allows these individuals to come uh, provide uh, to, to, to access our services. That's it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> Again, just a few a few things with with Ableist that I, that I heard. Individual needs. Individual needs. Um, I also heard meaningful work. I heard meaningful work in the community again. And of course, you know, I think I think from way back when, when I when I actually worked with BRS years and years ago, um, Ableist now I mean used to be pretty much a Greenwich based. We were, we, and, and you British sound like you are Fairfield County throughout Fairfield County. Oh, okay. So those are some major changes in their programming moving forward. So again, let's think about some of those things as we as we head towards our question and answer time. So next up, without further further hesitation, uh, Dr. Thalia. Comninos, uh, and she is the uh, intake supervisor at the Southwest Connecticut Mental Health Services, specifically the Young Adult Service Program. Yeah, I'll focus on Young Adult. Actually, I'm the supervisor for intake, generally, and we have several programs, and one of them is the Young Adult Services. So I'll speak more to that since that's the one that's relevant to this age group for the most part. So the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, state agency, there are five regions. We're in the Southwest Connecticut Mental Health System. 
and it's primarily in Bridgeport. There are two locations there. And I'm with the Du Bois Clinic, which is in Stamford. So our catchment area for the Du Bois Clinic is from Greenwich to Westport. And uh, in the intake department, we'll sometimes be referring um, callers and people inquiring potential clients to other services in, in the, our community and local communities in our catchment area. So um, depending on what's available. But we have the Young Adult Service Program for the area. And it's often referred to as YAS, so that's what you'll hear, YAS, Young Adult Services, Y-A-S. So for short, everybody calls it that. So the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services focuses on clients with major mental health problems, serious chronic problems, for the most part. The Young Adult Services has a little bit of a different shift, um, but it does focus on young adults who have some major mental health difficulty. And the eligibility for the Young Adult Services is that the client is between ages of 18 and 25. Generally, they're referred before 25. That's sort of the window within which the services are provided. It's sort of not a hard cutoff, but they do try to have the referrals be, you know, up until somewhere until the earlier mid-20s, so that, uh, so that the staff can work with the young adults for some period of time and really help them develop the skills to transition. Again, sort of one of those themes that comes across and so the uh, young adults who come into the program have usually a major mental health problem and are typically referred by the Department of Children and Families, but not necessarily so, even though that's most often the case. So they've been in the system. They're um, clients who've had some significant challenges and often a lot of trauma often a lot of disruption in their lives. And so the Young Adult Service Program helps them, helps address um, the areas where they need help, and the areas where they kind of were lagging behind for the various reasons, whatever was kind of challenging or missing in their developmental um, period. So the Young Adult Service Program focuses on a variety of areas, and it focuses, it, it does this within a culture it's client-centered and trauma-informed. That applies also to the other programs um, at DEMAS. That's very much the culture that has been developed um, in recent years. And the client-centered approach, even for the young adult, means that the service providers work with them. What do they want? Where are they at? It's very collaborative. It's nothing sort of <coughs> done to them. It's something that their, their engagement is really elicited. And the young adult team works very much to elicit that engagement, more so than it might in the other programs with the adult population, because they know that's what's needed at this point with the young adults. Um, they, they don't may necessarily have the sort of oomph and the motivation to, to uh, just readily engage. So they really spend a lot of time on engagement, on eliciting, on encouraging. If the person doesn't engage that easily, sort of, they'll call a lot, they'll go out to the house. They're somewhat community-based, not strictly office-based. And uh, it is a voluntary program, so the young adult has to want to some extent to, but it's all right <coughs> if their interest grows after the initial engagement, they get increasingly engaged. It often takes the young adults some time to really recognize and accept that they have some significant mental health challenges. There's just a lot of frequently sort of a denial of that, a rejection of that, and not really accepting it. So that takes time and that's understood where they're at. So the staff really uh, meets them where they're at. And they do a very multimodal approach. There are clinical services, that's very important. They can come for therapy. Uh, they come for psychiatric evaluation and management, regular medication management. Um, there's, there's case management and uh, to help them, perhaps they need to get um, Husky insurance or social security benefits. So the staff help them with this, assist them to do the things that, to get what they need 
and to have the support because they can't do it independently. They're still at that age where they're growing, they're developing, they need a lot of support, uh, hand-holding to some extent. Really, they're at the, the age and the phase where they still need a lot of support and assistance and kind of teaching to do these things, to develop these adult skills. So, and I just wanna say one more thing about the trauma-informed approach um, is a lot of the staff have very good, solid clinical training in trauma and to understand the clients through that lens since so many have experienced various kinds of trauma and to understand their kind of uh, emotional responses, their behavioral responses through the lens of trauma uh, so that they can have the best responses from staff and help them <laughs> overcome what have been some of the obstacles um, that came to be because of perhaps traumatic experiences. So they are clinical services, there are case management services, and um, employment, we hear that, and all of the speakers have talked so much about employment, because employment is really a big part of having, of the way that people integrate into um, the community and have meaningful lives. And so there's always emphasis on that and assisting the young adults to um, find an area of employment that also builds competency. So that also helps their sense of self, their mental health, to be able to feel competent and to, to do something in the world and to develop an income. So at the Young Adult Service Program, there's an embedded employment specialist um, some of the young adult service programs in the state have their own, that is a DEMAS employee. At the Du Bois Clinic, there's a, uh, an employee from, from private not-for-profit, Marrakech, who's embedded on the team to help the young adults develop employment. Um, there are some residential services in Bridgeport, not in Stanford, though for some young adults who've been in the YAS program in Stanford, and that it was determined that they could benefit from, in fact, very much needed the residential services. Some of those folks will then transfer up to Bridgeport, have the residential and the clinical and all of the other services there. Uh, it's a high level of service, a high level of contact provided. So the young adult has to be interested in doing that. And as I said, at least initially, and maybe, maybe more elicited and, and increase their engagement over time. So there's the, there's the therapy, there's the psychiatric medication management and ongoing evaluation, case management. There is a recovery support specialist embedded in the team at Du Bois Center and at some other EAS teams. And that's a person with a lived experience so that often the client can really relate. They provide support. They come from their own learning curve um, and so they can be particularly inspirational to clients. Um, most of the referrals, as I said, come from DCF, not necessarily. If someone wants to make a referral, they can call us directly, the intake team. Uh, there are some brochures there, but these are the statewide brochures. They give a lot of good information. The folks here are kind of the statewide people who do the administration and consultation. But if anyone wants to request services, they can call us directly, the Du Bois Center. Our number is 203-388-1600, and you ask for intake. We've gotten referrals from schools, from DCF, from child guidance, from um, self-referrals, family members, hospitals, if I didn't say that. So, uh, and then we will do a screening in the uh, call to the intake to the triage team and um, you know, kind of discuss what the needs are, and then if there's uh, continuing to have space, we do have some space right now in the Young Adult Program, we'll refer it. Uh, but the evaluation process at intake will also help us determine if the person is best suited for the Young Adult Service Team. You can be in the Young Adult Age Range, 18 to 25, still receive services from DEMAS, from Du Bois Clinic, or, or uh, various other um, locations in DEMAS, but you don't have to be in the Young Adult Service Program. So if it's not, that's not the program, but someone does still need the services of DEMAS, 
they can be in the other programs. There are various other programs for adults. FEMA serves 18 and over. Um, the young adult program requires a lot of level of participation. It offers frequent services. At Du Bois, they aim to have three or four contacts a week with the client. That doesn't mean they're all in person. They might be phone calls. One might be a psychiatric appointment. One might be the social worker. Another one might be the recovery support specialist or the case manager. But they aim for um, pretty intensive interactions to really help, to really help them through that developmental period to develop the skills uh, that they need. Because it's a high level of interaction, young adults who are working in school may not have the time for that, actually, and then we're open only from 8 to 4.30, so it has to also be within that time frame. But the folks who are successfully in school and working are generally the people who have achieved what the Young Adult Service tries to help them achieve. So if they need our services, they'll go into the adult outpatient uh, rather than Young Adult Services. So Young Adult Services aims to launch, to address their clinical needs, to do it in a, a collaborative, client-centered, trauma-informed way, and to help them develop the skills in kind of this safe environment with healthy, uh, predictable attachments of the care providers uh, to help them get to the next phase and to help them uh, in their educational progress or employment progress and to the point where they can be uh, as independent as possible. So uh, that's, the, that's the aim and that's uh, basically the configuration of um, how our team works at the board. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're almost there. Kathleen, you hanging in there? Hang on. I know. Talk to that clean up, right? Just some, some quick talking points from, uh, from the um, Young Adult Service Program at the Du Bois Center. Um, Client-centered, uh, trauma-informed, voluntary program. I heard employment, again. I heard meaningful lives, and then I heard also in, as independent as possible. You know, some pretty important talking points as we move forward to question and answer. So our final presenter before we get to question and answer, um, and I thank you for your patience, Kathleen, but uh, Ms. Kathleen Calway, she is the Autism Support and Resource Specialist with the State Department of Social Services, Autism Spectrum Disorder Services. Kathleen. Formerly it was housed at DDS where I was employed for many years, first in Berkeley three, then as a transition coordinator. And then I jumped over to um, the Department of Social Services when the division was transferred from an, a legislative act in 2016. We have a lifespan waiver, and I'm not gonna candy coat any of the information I'm gonna give you. We have a lifespan waiver where Illinois individuals are eligible from age three and up to have services such as clinical behavioral supports, social skills group, job coaching, life skills, community mentor, individual goods and services, personal emergency response system, respite, assistive technology, interpreter, non-medical transportation, specialized driving assessment, and living companion. We do not offer a residential component and we do not offer housing. That being said, the division currently has a waiting list of over 1,300. We have 94 slots to this division that are fully filled, and since this is a lifespan waiver, individuals only come off the waiver when they no longer require the services or they move out of state. I've been told that perhaps this year we're gonna get an additional 10 slots. That is not comfortable. What I always tell parents, when they say, well, why should I even sign up for the waiver? Legislators need to know the numbers in Connecticut about these individuals that would not otherwise qualify for DBS services. The lifespan waiver works with individuals with an IQ of 70 or above or those who do not have an intellectual disability. So parents and educators, change is gonna come from you. I report to the legislators on a 
quarterly basis for the autism um, advisory committee meetings. They know the numbers, but they need to hear from their constituents. They need to know the specific needs, and they need to know that funding needs to grow for this specific population. As an autism resource specialist, and I'm only one in the entire state, so I am covering from Rhode Island to New York City to Massachusetts to the ocean where sometimes I really want to throw myself in. But I am there to meet with parents. I am there to help you connect to your community. I am there to maybe go through a door that you might not otherwise have thought you would go through together, to kind of look at different things out of the box, to connect you and your loved one to the community as they enter into the adult world. This is not an easy thing. They don't call it the transition clip for nothing. This is not an entitlement program. So all the funding that we have falls within the existing funding parameters we get from the legislature. You know, I wish I had better news for you, and I could say, yes, everybody that applies is going to come in. They're going to be assigned a case manager. The services are going to start right away. That's certainly not the case. Unlike DDS, individuals who even apply for the waiver will not be assigned a case manager until they receive a slide on the waiver. But they do have access to me. Contact information is on our website under contacts. There's also a list of resources there. There's also, um, you know, uh, individual things that you can do while you are waiting. What I do do for, fam for families sometimes, when I go out and I have visits with them, we discuss their specific needs. We talk about the self-pay option, maybe utilizing SSI funding, utilizing some other types of funding. If the, the individual is between the ages of 18 and 21, being on Husky C, if you need those behavioral supports or some other supports such as uh, care coordination, from 18 to 21, if you're on Husky C, you can get those services through the state plan, which is administered through Beacon Health Options. Not a lot of people know this, but at least it's something for those critical years. I also work with families, if they do decide to go the self-pay option, to, curtail, to, to actually give them an individualized list of the private providers that have been vetted from DDS and approved to provide services for our waiver. I specifically do it by the town that they're in and by the service that they're looking for. There's a lot of services out there that haven't been fully vetted. Um, there's a lot of services that are coming on board every day. And there's a lot that you don't understand or, or might not even know about within your community. But it's a journey, and it's one that I'm willing to take with the families so we can put their loved ones on a path to a really great life. Kathleen, I really appreciate you coming down, and, and I know it's some kind of be a challenge to talk, but that's honesty. That's really what this is all about today, and I think it's information, and you need to know. Um, you know, we talk about you know once again. I, I hear Kathleen talking about budgets. Uh, I hear I hear Kathleen talking about um, 1,300 on a waiting list. Um, I hear about the lifespan waiver. Um, connecting to the community and I also heard Kathleen kind of offer her services as a resource and, and certainly I know in my my time you know going through a lot of the PPTs here at the high school and we have students in these situations not DDS eligible more of the autism waiver frustration on the part of parents I think Kathleen I'm hearing that you are offering yourself as a resource potentially to those individuals um, and again uh, you know, maybe there's that day when the state legislature says we're funding all 1,300. The point is, if you're not on that wait list, because I hear it, I'm not, you know, there's no reason for me to go on the wait list. If you're not on that wait list, it'd be so unfortunate that when those services do become available that your son or daughter's not on that wait list to get those services. And I think it's my understanding, I think our, your first selectman, our first selectman, should be running for lieutenant governor. It's so maybe a great time that our first left to be aware of some of the challenges facing our students afflicted with, the, with autism. So anyways, that's our panel. I really appreciate it. Give them a nice round of applause.
so, some, some question and answer. You know, I'm gonna say about 30 minutes or so, 45 minutes, we'll stay as long as possible. I'm gonna kind of preface this, preface this in a couple of ways. First, please with your questions. Confidentiality, we are taping, we are videotaping, no specific names. Um, please, I ask that. Um, generalities are preferred. Uh, some of the things that I would think about in terms of questions, um, you know, levels of support. And what I say by that is think about the level of support that your son or daughter receives through the public education system. And maybe a good question is the level of support that they're potentially facing in the adult service world. That is, I think, a huge issue, uh, something that you need to be aware of. Um, another thing, uh, maybe what parents can do at home with your sons and daughters to kind of prepare for adult services. Maybe that's a good question or something along those lines. Also, for our, our teachers and educators, what school districts can do to prepare students for adult services and to access those services. Maybe you have some questions about timing, when, when to apply, at what point, how old. Maybe there's some questions about there about guardianship conservatorship. That seems to come up an awful lot. So these are just some things that I'm thinking of as we move forward. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the panel sit. We're going to take questions one at a time. Ask your question. If it needs repeating, I will repeat it. And we'll let you know, if you have a question for one of the specific panel representatives, great. Or maybe the whole open it up to the whole panel. So here we go. Open it up. Yes. Uh, for Lewis and, and, uh, and for DDS, you know, our, our kids, for those kids who are in the transition program now, which is my son, uh, you know, we're used to a certain amount of kind of activities during the day and a time frame. Can you speak a little bit to kind of how a week might be broken up, kind of what hours can be expected to be engaged in a program, and what that might be split between, say, uh, uh, employment and, and, and skills and, and, and skills learning? Our program is a 30-hour week program, uh, 9 to 3, and the balance really depends on the individual. We have some folks who are competitively employed who drop into some of our programming, and then we have some folks who spend all 30 hours in one program. It really is individualized. We, we, uh, once we get somebody into, let's say, our life skills program, uh, we start working on a career plan with those folks so that there's some direction to what their focus is going to be in the near future. Those folks would probably tend to have more of a vocational week. Um, and we try to set that up through our life skills program. Some folks um, are not ready to work right off the bat. And that's why our life skills program is a little different from other organizations because you drop into an adult service provider and in an employment program and sometimes you're just dropped into whatever work they have available. Our program is different because we, we understand that that age group has very specific needs that need to be addressed before some are ready for the workforce, so we, we tailor it that way. But overall, it's a 30 hour program. To piggyback on comments, on our website, it's actually listed as a little button click on Q after you can do that, it brings you down to a qualified provider list. That's updated every week, two weeks by our Hartford office. That's a statewide list of all the providers that we have qualified for our families or individuals to tap into as resources, whether it be for day, for transportation, for respite, for whatever the case may be. It's an excellent resource. It's a not a sortable list, so I apologize, it frustrates me. Um, but when you look at that list, you'll be able to look at the service type that you're investigating for your family member and see who in your community offers that. Um, don't be misled by the addresses listed because some of those providers might be in your community, but their home base might be clear across the state, you just or out of state for that matter. So when in doubt, you can always reach out to us and you know kind of tweak, uh, tweak that list a little bit. Um, one of the uh, CES Cooperative Educational Services does an annual transition fair in March. It's a great opportunity for education professionals as well as families to go and just walk around and meet a whole bunch of providers all in one room and ask questions about the types of services they offer to your son or daughter or family member. Uh, it's a one-stop shop. Uh, there's about, it was you were there, correct? Yeah. Um, 25, 30 different vendors. 25, 30 different vendors and just in this area. 
that commit to going on a regular basis. Um, Lewis also mentioned about 30 hours a week. Well, 30 hours a week is one type of service monitoring. Um, he also mentioned competitive employment. We have a lot of young men and women who are working competitively who might get two, three, four, five hours of support a week. The rest of the time, they're on the job utilizing their natural supports that the employer offers and or the community offers. Um, so we might have folks who are getting maybe five to $10,000 of annualized resources just for that job post to check in periodically and they're doing fine. And we have others who are in more intense programs who are 30 hours a week, typically Monday through Friday, um, doing more of that community integration, maybe some volunteering, some ADL skills, daily living skill enhancements, and things like that. So it really is individualized, as Lewis mentioned, and it can look completely different from your child to the child next to you, the child across the street. Um, so but working with us, working with the providers, we can build that. In our system, you can go directly to ABLIS and we contract with ABLIS for your child, the money's assigned to your child. Or you can private hire. You can set it all up and self-direct, as we call it, and hire the staff, design your Monday through Friday, and what you want it to look like, and you can do it that way, too. So there's a lot of different options that you can utilize through our funding, whether it be directly, go, we fund them for your child, or you work with us and we design a plan together. So, hope that answers. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Uh, this question from Lewis, how is your service funded? Do we pay you as parents? Primarily it's DDS funded. Um, but we, we do we do work with families and have a private pay option. But if your your son or daughter qualifies for DDS services, they're going to provide the funding to, to access our services. We have over 35 communities that really the kids will get their Our living situations? Right, that, those are our, our residential options, our living options. So we have folks who live in more traditional group homes, we have folks who live in supported living, we have some folks who live in home shares. They're all different types of uh, living situations and the support needs for the folks in the different models is different. Um, so it really depends on what kind of support they need in that setting. When you say the mutual jobs, what type of jobs can you do for Sure, we have folks working, uh, we just, there's a lot of retail, um, we do some of that as well, but we really try to focus on what the, the individual wants to do. So, for instance, we just started working with this young man who um, on the very high end has a degree and in graphic arts. So we were focused on getting him something in graphic arts. So we've applied to internships, we've gotten him something with an organization that does graphic art, and so there's, that example, then there are folks who just want to work in one of our businesses. We've developed several small businesses through ABLIS to help train our folks on the ground so that they can then take those skills and, and go out into the community. So you provide the, from what you said, the three different types of services for the family. Yes. Do Maybe each of you can handle that one in terms of, of, of you know, age and, and eligibility and how long. Well, with DDS, you can apply as young as three. The youngest I've seen come through with eligibility was a year and a half old, but typically it's three. Um, then we have to go through a redetermination around the age of eight is when typically the first cognitive testing is conducted through school systems to validate their eligibility for lifelong. If you're eligible for DDS services, pretty much going to be lifelong until you choose to um, exit our system. We have folks who voluntarily say, I don't want it, you're helping me more, and sign paperwork and say, here you go. We have people who leave, and then obviously um, life's natural path of just passing away. So those typically are the three where people exit our system. Um, so we are lifelong, and we are one of the primary funders for agencies like ABLIS. So we rely on the state budget to then issue to your son or your daughter, your son or your daughter, to then go shopping and using that list I referenced on my provider list to go buy the services that would be able, to, that would address the current needs. So uh, we work collaboratively. You, uh, your family member is the core, and then you're working with us to secure the dollars, and then you can go shopping, and uh, we guide you along that process. Sean's agency has a little bit different 
parameters. Yep. And so when I said 16 to 21, <coughs> that's just about a lot. Um, it's 16 to 21 or when they take their deployment for level up purposes. That means VRS doesn't stop working with them, it's just they're not eligible for the transition, the pre-employment transition services anymore that I talked about. When they do graduate, whether it's at 21, they receive their diploma senior year, that's when we start transitioning them into our adult services. Adult services ranges from 16 all the way to 80. Um, but it, as Brian said, we're more of a short-term agency. When someone is competitively employed in a job, they've met those skillful, uh, milestones and measurable skill gains, that's when we look to close out their case. And then, as I said, it's not a one and done. You can always come back and reapply, or kind of as Lewis said, if you know, he may be started with some of the services and he may contact us and say, I think this person is ready for employment now. Um, they can be referred that way as well. And that has happened a lot. So how about the voice center? The, the time limited? The, oh, the youth, well again, youth services the, versus maybe your adult services? The, the young adult services, and again, the kind of window is 18 to 25. But if someone continues to need uh, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services programming after that they would transition into one of the adult outpatient programs and they might transition into that even before they reach the age of 25 if they have kind of reached all of the, the goals and <coughs> achievements that um, they were striving for in the young adult service program so one can continue to receive services from Venus uh, as long as needed there's no end limit. Only the Young Adult Service Program is time limited. Kathleen? And for the autism waivers age three and up, uh, DDS currently determines the eligibility for the autism waiver, so the application is the same one that DDS uses, and it goes to central office at DDS, but it's age three right through the life span. So let's talk about that for a second. Can we just, how that works? So you, when you go back to the eligibility screen when I was talking, that third option for you to be applying for somebody who has autism and no intellectual disability, that would provide you with the information about the application and such. But if you clicked on the link that I did, which was for applying to somebody with intellectual disability, the application's right there. You just print it, you're filling out the same exact application, you're providing the same exact materials, with the exception that you want to ensure that you're including the tests on autism, the CARS or the ADOS clinical test for that particular diagnosis, okay? Because you don't want to be determined ineligible for ID, intellectual dis disability, when you're intending on applying for autism because then you don't meet the criteria for that. So make sure you have that particular test. Now, if your son or daughter or family member has autism and you're unsure if those clinic, those cognitive test scores are gonna go either way after they review it, include everything. Include all the stuff that you need for the cognitive, include the autism on clinical cognitive test. Everything, and let our staff from Harford sift through it and make an appropriate decision as to which side. Is it autism services or is it DDS's side that would be most appropriate? And like Brian was saying too, if the child is under the age of eight and they are determined to be eligible, they'll go back to the DDS helpline up until the age of eight when they get redetermined and whether that IQ is a 70 or above or a 60 or below. So the bottom line is DDS, eligibility unit, does all the eligibility for DDS and for the Autism Waiver Program or the Autism uh, Program through DSS. As we speak on April 20th. As of today. As of today. <laughs> As of today. <laughs> now, let me ask this question, um, and this comes up. Let's say we have a situation, testing, it's kind of borderline, uh, maybe autism, maybe ID, we're not sure, 70 IQ, 71, 72, uh, the adaptives are kind of in the middle. Um, what would you recommend to a family in that situation? Apply. 
Apply. Yes. Apply. Let our psychologist in the Hartford make a determination. So should we be fretting over here like we need to make a decision? We need to say this student is ID or this student is yeah. autistic. An important thing to remember is they're looking at the developmental period. So if you have somebody that's going to be reaching age 18, you want to have a, the most recent evaluation you can have before that individual hits a, age 18. Okay. So when in doubt, apply. Apply. Again, you have appeal rights, so if you're not satisfied with the decision, you might be approved for autism services and disagree with that and appeal and say, my son or daughter has a deficit and should be under the ID side. We've had families appeal that. We've had them appeal the other way. They've been denied both sides, and they appeal the decision in general. So there's appeal rights if you're not satisfied with the And the appeal rights can be applied to all the agencies. So. Yep. For example, if the kid is going to go to college with support and the opposite of right the college be a supervisor is $20. So the question is but then he's a, like a D. So the question is, a student attends college and still will they be eligible for services after completion of college? It would be if they're eligible for DDS services, we are planning for them. If he or she chooses to go to some collegiate act, uh, program, that is their choice. We do not fund that. We cannot fund that. It's not permissible. But he's offered uh, the college to use the provider. Based on what resources are available and what their needs are, then we can look at doing appropriate service referrals for that. So, if you have, if your son or daughter is exiting in June, I highly encourage you to use the resources that we've been planning for and can allocate at that time, no matter if it's minimal or all of it. Because if you don't use it, those get recycled and go to another student that we weren't aware of who might have just came through eligibility in May. Um, and then you're going to be buying for resources just like anybody else four or five years down the road. So it's very important to work with us to design an individualized plan that addressing your son and daughter family members' needs using the resources we have access to right then and there as graduate. Sir? Well, and then you. Uh, the question to raise this. Could you speak to a little bit about your approach to the vocational? Getting the skills are they provided off-site or at the job site? Uh, I think one thing that I've heard is that you know students remain in remain off-site and they 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 don't get any further skills, but jobs don't exist. And the best way to learn is to be on the job. Right. So, so where where do those job skills take place? Where does those do those career readiness job readiness skills take place? The best place is on the job, uh, but we do both. We do both. Uh, some folks need a little bit more hand holding, need a little bit more support, so we can do that in house. Uh, but really, you learn the job on the job, and we support with our job coaching um, at the job site. We work very closely with employers to communicate what deficits there are, what skills there are, and, and to make sure that we're addressing that appropriately. But yeah, you learn best at the job site. This is one question for DDS. Could you, could you mention about the paid, paid and directed model? Uh, could pay and collateral generate uh, to, or is it really paid and by paid? Or in other words, two or three parents with similar issues can get together and create. So if two or three parents have similar issues, can they get together and pull funding together to plan or, a program? Or instructional programs. In our instructional program? We have to. I'll be honest with you, we've seen that happen with residential services. I haven't seen that happen specifically with a day service. The exception to that statement is we've had some families uh, design a business uh, where it might be a baking business or dog biscuit business. We have one family who designed a farm stand because they own a farm, so they designed a, a business opportunity for their family member with um, uh, disabilities to have their own operational farm stand and they did the whole growing through the harvesting to the selling. So there are opportunities for families to kind of pull back toward their resources together, their ideas to together, and it might be developing a business or it might be developing a program um, where you're self-directing, you're self-directing, you're self-directing, and somehow or another there's interaction during that Monday through Friday um, or they're doing a similar activity, so it's not just the staff and the individual always. It might be a staff person with multiple peers doing an activity or a work program. So there, there's a lot of different creative options out there. 
So if I can ask, going back a few years, there was a time when I think DDS had what was called self-determination funding or self-determination program. Is that something that is still out there and still available to families? Yes, it is, Christopher. Okay. Can you explain that a little bit? It's, what? it's not specific funding for that, but okay. it's a program model where folks can self-direct their resources and help assign to them. So that is still alive. We have a supervisor who is a director and a supervisor and case managers who are in that division in all three regions. So it is alive and well. I'm not sure for that. Questions? Um, you had all of you are from different programs and services. Are all of your services means tested, meaning that you need to be on Husky C to access the funding stream for each of your services? You just go to the, the four of you from the state agencies, because obviously ABLE is a big part of DES. But which of this which of your programs are needs are means tested? Um, for us, um, as I talked about, it's really looking at the disability, um, not the Medicaid, not um, that type of um, those things. Um, for us, we look at the testing that either the school provides or sometimes we do outside testing to um, get a better understanding um, of the individual's needs before we look at the functional limitations. So we want to see disability first and then look at how those functional limitations. Um, for a specific learning disability, we look at a 22-point discrepancy, um, the 22-point discrepancy model. Uh, and then, you know, we look at the outside uh, resources of someone who's seen um, a, a psychologist or um, who is identified as intellectually disabled. You know, we get information from um, DDS that will help um, qualify them. Um, but in terms of like Medicaid for us, nothing like that. For DDS, without trying to draw a massive confusion, for eligibility purposes, no. <coughs> you can be eligible for DDS services. Now let me put the asterisk. Right? <laughs> to access like our family grant program, which I currently still oversee, there is no, it's not means test. We ask questions about household and income and assets. Does it apply to how I make decisions about the grants going out the door? No. At age 18, your family member is their own legal adult in the state of Connecticut, regardless of their functioning level. That's why I mentioned guardianship or conservatorship as, is that appropriate? That's a decision made by the family. It's can you, can you just repeat that? At age 18, they are their own legal adult. They are the decision maker. You're no longer a parent of minor. What that does though, is now your household income and assets no longer apply when they are applying for state and federal benefits. Okay, so with that said, we encourage on our side of the DDS world is to entertain the guardianship or and or conservatorship depending on what's appropriate prior to 18, because you can apply for guardianship 180 days prior to the 18th birthday. <coughs> Still a parent of a minor, that decree does not go in effect until the 18th birthday. With the conservatorship or conservatorship, or everyone you want to pronounce it, there's apple, you know, potato, potato, um, that you cannot apply prior to the 18th birthday. The 18th birthday is the earliest you can apply for that. Both done through probate court. You can then apply for Social Security benefits, Supplemental Security Income, SSI, of 18. You can then apply for Medicaid. We're looking for the Husky C and specific under Medicaid. You do it in that order because that little court decree paperwork that you have to get from probate, Social Security wants to see it. It's their way of deflecting fraud, people just applying for benefits over somebody with a disability and not knowing about it. And then they're going to want to look at it from our colleagues at DSS who do the Medicaid, they're going to want to copy that as well. We, as DDS, cannot assign an individual money for an employment program, a day program, a residential, unless they have the Medicaid. Okay, so it's not means tested per se, but we use the Medicaid insurance to put them on our waiver programs, to which we're getting 50 cents of every dollar back through the federal government for our services. So if your son or daughter's day program costs forty thousand dollars a year. We're getting, if it's full utilization, we're getting 20 of that 40 back through reimbursements using the Medicaid ID number. Our case management staff can generate income through their contact and the work they do with each and every one of uh, the youth in our, our system. They can generate enough revenue to justify their annual, income, or their annual salaries. 
if they feel appropriate with further supports and services. So we're trying to be as self-sufficient as possible so that it doesn't look as you know, beneficial to cut our services in the legislative eyes. Um, but all the dollars that come back in through the revenue mechanism, that stream, come in through the um, general fund. It doesn't come right back to us. Um, but we are approving efficiencies through the billing, through the utilization of the services by the folks we support and our own staff. So it's not means tested, but we do require that in order for us to release dollars. It's actually a state law. I can't remember the exact public act. But, <coughs> but Davis? Um, for the most part, when folks have private insurance, we refer them to other providers because they have more options. And we're there for the people who have fewer options. There may be some exception to that for young adults who might be on parents' insurance. Frankly, most of the young adults coming to us are on Husky, but there may be some uh, exception if they're on parents' insurance still, but then moving off of it to Husky. For the most part, though, Demas does serve uh, those who have state insurance or are uninsured, uh, but not the folks who have more options and resources. DSS? To be eligible for the autism waiver, you do not have to have Medicaid Husky C, but to get the slot, you do have to have Husky C. And just reiterating what Brian said about the state recouping 50% out of your job. Um, they do not have to have Husky C to talk to me or for me to come out and do a visit. But again, for those kids from 18 to 21, if they want to access those additional services through Beacon, they need to have that Husky C. Okay. Questions? A couple more. Yes? Um, residential supports, are there any? Residential supports, are there any? Yes. Is there residential funding for those supports? Limited. Real estate. There are, as Lewis mentioned, there's a variety of different residential options out there. Each of those models. If I were to call Lewis for your office tomorrow morning and submit an my son, our funding currently is going towards emergencies. So if your family situation, if your, if your son's situation was defined in our in by our department as being an emergency that would allow us to allocate resources for residential services. We don't have a, a pot of gold, sadly enough, to, to say, oh, we need that, perfect, here you go, you need that, perfect. Our, our residential budget is extremely tight, extremely tight. And we have an average of about 20 to 30 emergencies per region at a given time. So, it, you know, and some of those could be a year, 10, $15,000 to enhance current situation, or those might be a $200,000 to $300,000 group home situation based on the you know, what they're presenting with. Um, some of our emergencies, unfortunately, we have no control over. Uh, yeah, we find out about them yesterday. I had an emergency place two people, three people last week um, because of abuse and neglect situations. I had one get released from corrections that we didn't have, there was no plan for. So there's certain things that we don't have no idea are coming. Um, but I assure you, if God forbid an emergency arose, we do our very best with that family to identify an appropriate setting. And if there's no family, then we do our best to you know, work with our provider network, um, like Lewis, uh, Ableist, uh, to get a temporary situation that the person's safe, we know they're not going to be in harm's way, and then we work through the next couple weeks to find something more permanent. But there's no natural sort of transition, if you will, or roll up that one can anticipate that one can plan for. Well, there's a couple options. And Lewis mentioned shared living. Yeah. Shared living is a new uh, concept that's rolling out amongst the, you know, through the state. But US families have opportunities to do some planning themselves, which now, which is afforded under the ABLE Act. Um, that affords families to score away some money to purchase services and supports that state and federal government might not be able to do. Um, there's other plans that, planning that families have done where they don't rely on state agencies. You know, DDS or DMIS or DSS shouldn't be the only people at the table. It can be a collaboration amongst community entities, 
uh, not-for-profits, families uh, working together, and families families sources. Yep. Families providing natural supports and just asking, hey, we just need this for this person and this for this person, and that decreases. Assistive, assistive technology, excuse me, is another huge thing that we're promoting where it decreases the need for a physical staff person to be on site. On site. You might be doing Skyping, you might be doing you know, other safety mechanisms between window alarms, door alarms, stove shutoffs. There's a whole bunch of different technology out there that we're looking into and we have to keep people who are using and have decreased the reliance on the need for a physical staff to be present and it's significantly uh, less cost, which allows us to do more of that versus one person at this cost. So there's a lot we can do, just a matter of let's connect, have a conversation, have a plan more around that. I can't cut you a check. I don't have that authority. As much as I would love to be able to do that. But in fact, you know, I heard through third parties where I hand glue a house tomorrow, that there's no guarantee that it's going to be staff playing. You can hand them a house, go right ahead. But, <laughs> no, there's, no, no, <laughs> but there's no guarantee your son or daughter would end up in the house. That's the guarantee or, out there. Or any kind of natural, more natural evolution of um, if you go from A to B, you will eventually get to C. Right. That's what I'm looking for, that I go to find and the, find that path. The, the, the challenge is the cost and, and uh, cost I, of, yeah. of running a group home in Connecticut on average is about $120,000 a year. Right. On per person. Per person. I would imagine that's probably a national average. No, that's, uh, a, that's exactly. a New York average. Yeah. National's around 90. Yeah. yeah. Bank is higher. Yeah. But we're getting rid of those. Those large congregate settings are, we're decreasing the developments on that as much as we possibly can. And it's going to more into the individualized into a shared situation of supported living or smaller two or three person, um, what we call CRS is continuous residential support options will still offer a 24 hour um, staffing structure. Um, so we are, we, the days of big units of 10, 15 people on them, or cottages that had 20 or 30 in them, or group homes that when I started way back, it was six or eight people in the house. Those days are over. They're getting smaller, 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 more realistic. I don't know about you, I, well, I don't want to live with six or eight people let alone not family. I don't want to no, do that. No, but I wouldn't want my son's world to go from, I wouldn't want my son's world to go from black to white, but that's so great. Agreed. And that's where planning with any one of our agencies comes into play, is outlining that. And if you went on our website, uh, Life Course is a huge thing that we're promoting, and Kathy would agree with that, as, as well as um, Lewis and the others. But that gives you an opportunity to, to help your family members articulate what they want for their life, whether it be next year or five years or 15 or 30. You have a, then have a say and a vision for them as well. And you get everybody around that support team that you have around them, and you identify who else you need to bring to that table. As I say, it's not a dinner party between us, our agency, and their family. It's a dinner party of much larger magnitude that we need to start looking at who can come to that table, what can they provide, is there a cost or is it natural, is it extended family, is it faith-based organization, so I mean, there's a lot of different things. That planning is going to help articulate what you want, what you desire for your son or your daughter when you're no longer able to provide the care. So, so it's a little bit, the, the life planning is a little bit yeah. of the person-centered planning, mm -hmm. a little bit of the maps and maps, the path, path. That, but it's, a, it's kind of the DDS answer to that, and it's a, it's a much larger uh, endeavor, but it's just a great planning tool that they have on, on their website. A couple of more questions, and then we're going to kind of close it around 3.30. It's been a long afternoon. Uh, anyone else? Yes? Um, this is a good question, uh, Sean, about the uh, level of, um, what would be like an example of a case? Like, would it be, you know, 17 year old high school student who do an assessment? Um, they are shattered. Like, so, what would so, be like a We've got a lot of different, um, you know, as everyone has said here, it's very individualized. Right. Um, we said the program is 16 or 21, but we would say, when is the student ready for the services as well? Are they going to benefit at 16, or are they going to do they need some more services from the school first before they come to us? And um, so, an individual case, um, 
for um, like a job shadow. Um, we've had a couple students go here to visit uh, auto mechanic um, place, and then happening. Then I come back once a month and you know talk to them about that. So we contract a goodwill, and goodwill does all that, and then they come back and talk with me to see is it a realistic job goal for them? What did they learn? You know, what steps do they need to get there? You know, and that's kind of my role is overseeing it and then helping them break down piece by piece of what, you know, what they need to get to that type of job. And even if it is realistic. Um, and in the summer we have, uh, we work um, with employers, entry level type positions. Um, I always like to say the job shadowing and informational interviewing that I talked about is more career focused and then the jobs in the summer if available are more like entry level type positions. So just to build, you know, as everyone here said, to build those independent skills to have them get some work experience. You know, just like a lot of us, you know, we all have started with some type of entry level position and that's kind of the purpose of our summer programs if we do off if we do have them available every year. But I think Sean, you're you're looking for a referral of of the student of, of the year of their graduation to so start work. Yes. Okay. So if they're graduating as it's a senior, sec. we're going to make that referral at the end of their junior year. Yes, end of their junior year. So we want to get them started early. Um, but Chris is saying, if we know a student, if you, know, you guys have your PPT meetings and. You know, 18 to 21 year old program is talked about all the time at those meetings. We would, you know, I would review the case and say, okay, let's let's hold off until the first year of the 18 to 21 year old program. We have some time. What can the school be doing first to build some of those um, skills, and then um, that first year of the uh, program, we look towards um, having them apply. Um, but we, you know, we always say. End of, the, end of the junior year, uh, beginning of the junior year, um, and then uh, we really like to say that, you know, prioritizing, uh, like I said, if we know someone is graduating at um, senior year, we want the referrals for semester and junior year. But if we know someone is, you know, graduating down the road, we say either the first year or the second semester of their senior year. So I have, a couple of, I have a couple of things I just want each of you to cover before we leave yep. today. Um, the first thing is kind of to piggyback on the job. Uh, jobs, I heard, I heard employment in almost every presentation. Um, you know, we're, we here at the high school in our, our 18 to 21 year old program, we do a lot of, you know, employment, et cetera, uh, job searching. How specific, how creative, how flexible are all of you in terms of finding those jobs that really match the passion and the abilities of specific students, such as many, many of our students, maybe students on the spectrum, they have specific interests. You know, maybe it's STEM, maybe it's a video game, maybe it's something along those lines. How much leeway, how much success do you have in terms of trying to meet those, those needs, those interests of those students? You know, in terms of BRS purposes, we really do try our best to make it as customized and individualized as possible we you know but at the same time you know we may start off with an entry level position but building that way up to um, something that they're really interested in so we're trying to our agency has really shifted from just getting a job our agency has shifted to the model of guiding the person through college if applicable well, not everyone is appropriate for college, but guiding them through college to help them make those uh, measurable skill gains. So, um, you know, I talked about um, you know, getting a job, but it's really making those measurable skill gains to get the job. So uh, we really do work with them um, as much as possible. We put them out on assessments to see what type of work they can do. Um, on the job trainings are a real big thing for us, and that's very customized to what indi individuals' uh, strengths, individuals' interests. Um, so we kind of, we have a lot, we have a variety. Okay. Anyone else? DDS world, we rely on them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's their yep. job. Yep. Um, 
No, but in, in all seriousness, we do rely heavily on doors yeah. to get that component done, and then they rely on us to sustain that with the job coaching. However, with that said, there's a lot of youth who go through doors and it's determined or not, they don't meet their criteria. But that doesn't stop the opportunity in our system to continue that employment discussion and doing the customized employment, working with our vendors, uh, career plans, and things along those lines. So even though he or she might not be eligible for um, DOORS BRS, they still can get a job. They can still get uh, meaningful employment in the community just through a different means, which we would fully support working with our vendors. And like I said before, that may happen, they may not be ready when they leave here, the level that we may say, you know, at the end, we don't really know, think that the person can benefit from adult services getting the job right now, but then they go to, you know, lose this program, and then it was a, they made tremendous um, strides. I think it's time to come back to us to kind of evaluate and see what type of job they can do now. So it's not like I would keep saying, it's not a one and done for us. So the team approach again, as you know, Brian was really saying before. We've actually hired some of our own consumers, individuals who are eligible for our services, who are also state employees for our agency. So there are what we classify as general worker roles, where they might be you know, working in some of our offices, doing um, office clerk type of assistance. Um, and then we also have self advocates. Uh, we have a number of positions on self advocates statewide. And they're charged with doing a lot of trainings, legislative actions, uh, policy changes. Um, they meet with our commissioner quite regularly. Um, they maintain our um, self-advocate website on our website. That's all them. We can't post a single thing to their website without going through all that. Um, so there's a lot of employment opportunities that we offer, not as much as I would love to see, but we, that we do offer as an agency to those we actually support. So, and they're all paid minimum wage or greater. Get the benefits of that every part time employee would, so they're actually on payroll just as much as they can support. I'm going to go back to your question because I have uh, a good example um, of, the, of the, team, the team approach. Um, a couple years ago, I worked with a student um, who had a real high interest in um, childcare. Um, school did a great job of having him do some volunteer experience. Um, we work with him on certain, you know, self-advocacy skills, self-determination skills, while the school was doing the hands-on work with him, the volunteer work. And from all the skills that he learned, when we transitioned him into adult services, I made the recommendation to the adult counselor that we think that he could, you know, continue making strides and go to training for child care. Um, so with our adult services now, he is being guided through a child care program um, to get a certification in that um, so that he can work. So right now he's actually taking his test um, to get certified. So that's kind of an example of you know, the team approach going one by one and how each agency can kind of help. Just one real quick point. It starts as young as three to start thinking about future. As young as three when you're looking at IEPs how is that going to go going to the attitude over the years and the increase in dependence, safety skills, employability, everything. That, that tool, that document is a foundation by which you can work off of it. It starts as young as an elementary school. And when I started out, I was volunteering in Special Olympics many years ago. I've been in the field for 25 years or more. Who knew I was going to land there, but they, my initial engagement working with the folks that I currently work with and for started as young as six, seven, eight years of age. So you never know those life experiences might be what Doris uses down the road or we use down the road from an employment standpoint. But those skill sets, as small as they might be in those, those IEP goals, as young as elementary school, you got to look at it when they're leaving at 21. How is that going to maximize their independence? Is that going to make that employee is, you know, how are we going to build, build, build the each and every uh, planning doc? So, so, and even uh, at, go ahead. Oh, well, we got the show, Chris. Yeah. All right. So, so even at, take it off. continuing that conversation, it's, you know, starts at home. What type of chores are they doing to build some of those responsibilities? Um, you know, learning how to do their laundry, uh, taking out the trash. Those are all building 
those skills as Brian's kind of talking about to meet those goals. Five motor. Yes. So five actually, motor. actually, we're, we're, I was interrupting you, and I apologize, but I'm actually that is exactly what I was going to say to kind of close things up today. What is it that school districts? What is it that parents can be doing to help with the transition process and ultimately helping? ultimately helping their son and daughters to be as independent as they possibly can be. And I would really like each of you just to spend a minute to talk about that. What can school districts, what can parents be doing to help facilitate that process to access these wonderful services that you all provide? Let's we'll start with Kathy. Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> well, just like what we said, number one, let them be independent. Let them be independent at home. Let them be independent in school. Think out of the box. Think creatively. Look at their special interests. Look at look at the things that they love to do. There's not a wrong door to go through. Don't ever let anybody tell you there is. Uh, varied uh, opportunities in multiple settings for work. Um, ex expose your child to as many jobs in different settings as you possibly can. Something's going to trigger you know, something and they're going to love it and, you know, an organization like Ableist can, can follow up with that. Um, get your kids out in the community. Our program model is largely community-based. They're going to be on their feet in the community working, volunteering, uh, going to classes, many different things. That's our model. That's really the way to prepare these kids. We want to get them out in the community. We want to get them exposure in their own neighborhoods using the vendors, using the supermarket, using the library, using the gyms. It, it helps us, you know, with, with service provision if they come with those skills. Um, coming a little bit more from a clinical perspective, but still sort of feeding into the same objectives, I would say that the kind of most significant things one can do for the child is um, validation, empathic listening, something that, that, all of that that builds their sense of self, where they are. And it doesn't mean you sort of validate a bad behavior, but you, you give them the opportunity to express their feeling and leave the space for the feeling and validate that they have it, not that they shouldn't. Create consistency and predictability. That creates the safety that they can relax and grow and be themselves and discover themselves. I've always said, God, if I could take, if I had only one sort of interpersonal thing to take to a desert island, one clinical skill, that would be it. They're your own individual. You gotta meet them where they're at. You gotta maybe do extra hand holding, but as much as you can do to do the same you would do for any other student, any other child, whether they have a disability or not, challenge them to do the same exact things. It might take you four months or six months longer to teach them how to do laundry than a non-disabled child. Don't give up. Let them be as independent as possible. As, as uh, Lewis indicated, community. Your communities are having an immense amount of support with them, depending on where you live. Use them. They're wonderful resources. Building those relationships builds safety skills, builds communication skills, builds interpersonal skills. And every little exposure that you give your family member, they're building a skill set, whether you see it or not, that we can all tap into down the road, developing a plan or working at a, looking at a work program or a residential service. So let them succeed, let them fail, just like you would whether they had a, didn't have a disability, and challenge them. You're a team. It's not us versus them. Okay? You're a family. You have, you have a, a, youth, a young man, a young woman who has special needs. Use the team around you. Use the school. They have wonderful resources. Use us as state agencies or private providers. We have resources. We might not have the bank accounts, but we have people who have been in these jobs for many years and are a wealth of knowledge, like Kathy. The one Kathy of all Connecticut. You got down here in Greenwich for that. We're committed. We just need everybody to be as committed around your family member. And it starts at home. It really does start at home. So whatever we can do to help you 
do that work, family grants, I talked about that earlier, it's an opportunity to, to help challenge you, challenge your family member so that they increase their independence. They succeed in school, they succeed in their community, they succeed at work, and they succeed living independently, possibly, or with a friend. Who knows? No, I'm just gonna echo what Brian said. It's really letting them fail, you know, building themselves up. Um, I have them do the laundry a couple times. If they're having difficulty with it, then like Brian said, then come back, but let them do it on their own first. Let them fail and build themselves up because that's what works all about, you know. Um, I think that's a big mindset, and like I said before, you know, just the responsibility starts at home, uh, building those skills. You know, I think the most important thing is, is you know, Lewis, like getting in the you know, getting in the community to volunteer, uh, getting them out to talk to people. You know, um, those build the social skills, the, you know, the cognitive skills, just. Um, you know, different environments help uh, the individuals out. Some people thrive in other, you know, some people thrive in school, some people don't, but they, some people thrive in the community. Um, so it's just giving them the opportunities to go out and do something. And then Brian and Lewis said, using us as resources to help be able to provide those opportunities and resources to help. Okay, um, I'm just going to say thank you. Thank you, everyone. I want to say this has been a wonderful turnout. Uh, you know, we never know. We never know when we do something like this what kind of turnout we're going to have from staff and or or parents. We've had over 50 people attend today. This is wonderful. This really gives me energy to want to do more of these in the future. I really, really, really want to thank our panel. Let's give them a hand. They, they came from far and wide today throughout the, well, you can, um, and you know, I really mean this, and, and we've had representation today from agencies that we haven't seen uh, here at King Greenwich, so I truly, truly appreciate them coming down and providing their expertise. Um, their resources, they're here, um, they've given you information. Please think about it, at least leave today with, 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 with your mind kind of thinking about transition and the future. And then just, just the last thing that I want to say, um, a couple of thank yous. I want to thank Celeste for helping in the booth. I want to thank Jason for his wonderful videography. Thank you. And, and again, really, uh, parents, it's about independence. And, and we don't know agency-wise and service-wise where things are going to be at in one year, five years, and 10 years. The more independent your son or daughter is, the better they're going to be able to access whatever those services are down there in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And their life is going to be that much more meaningful. Keep that in mind as we plan forward. School districts, keep that in mind as we plan forward. Thank you all. Have a great day. If our staff can sign in. There's